Right, welcome to this whatever it is. Ages and ages ago, just after the Mayan calendar ran out in 2012, I did a 20 minute video of me trying to play this strange little game that I'd gotten a floppy disk from my uncle once upon a time. It's called Le Fetiche Maya, or something approaching that, and it was released by a French studio called Silmarils in 1989. I remembered about it recently and I wanted to see how the game ended, so I tried to look up a video and I found I was actually one of the very few people who had uploaded videos about this game. All of those videos just showed confused wandering similar to my own. So I decided I'm going to do a full playthrough myself. I was aided by a guide written by Sabatianos on Abandonia, and as far as I can tell that's still the only walkthrough for this game in existence. By the way, this music, which does not appear in the PC version, is the only significant bit of sound produced throughout the entire game, so if you want to just watch the game being played, you can feel free to turn me off now. With that said, let's start a new game. So with very little ceremony, the game starts by dumping us outside a shop somewhere in Mexico, as you can tell by the hats. The first point of order is to go inside and get ourselves equipped for the upcoming journey. It's quite easy to tell what items are going to be useful by looking at the actions on the right hand side of the screen, which are all awkwardly mapped to the function keys. As we buy items, the useful ones show up on the blank squares, and you can fill out your abilities right at the beginning. In addition, we want to purchase this thing, which looks like a baked potato but is allegedly a water canteen, and we'll get ourselves some food as well. With that done and our wallet cleared out, we're free to wander out of the shop and get our journey started. Except we're immediately hindered by this shady looking bearded rival turning up to bother us. He'll occasionally appear throughout the game as we explore and try to pick a fight, and you can punch back but you can only knock him out temporarily. Just now we're going to be the bigger man and just ignore him and climb into our jeep to head to Uxmal. And by the way, I'm going to pronounce everything in this game wrongly and I'm sorry. The game's driving sections are fairly basic and are backed by an infuriating drone that's meant to sound like the engine, but bear in mind that this was 1989 and having any sort of 3D-ish environment looked pretty impressive. In these, there aren't any difficult corners, but you'll occasionally have to choose one of two routes when the road splits. Often, taking the wrong route will result in you reaching a dead end, or an unmarked gorge where you'll end dead. Just now, we're not actually going to the destination that we picked, we're going to make a stop off at this native village instead because we need to get some items. Every location in the game, even the minor ones, has a unique background like this, and they're small, but honestly they look reasonably decent. What we're doing here is the bartering system, which is a bit like the store, except you can only trade items. The barterer's entire inventory is shown at first, and then you have to select an item from your own inventory. They'll only then offer you items that they think are worth trading for what you've offered. On this occasion, we need to trade our meat for one of her jars, the water canteen for this plate-looking thing, and a pack of cigarettes for the other jar. While I may be trying to sound fairly authoritative as to what's happening, I really have no idea what I'm doing and I'm just following the walkthrough as the author has already done all the necessary trial and error involved to get these items for the lowest possible trades. With our newly acquired souvenirs in hand, we want to turn around and go back to Merida, which was our starting point, in order to sell off these newly acquired items. At this point, you might be wondering if anything you're seeing makes a bit more sense if you've read the manual, but I can promise you that that unfortunately isn't the case. All you get in the game box is a small pamphlet that explains the controls and has a bit of backstory. The man with the haircut here is allegedly archaeologist Michael Fairbanks, who is trying to follow a clue left by his recently deceased boss about having to reconstruct a broken Mayan fetish and find the priest Tuscar's treasures. With that, you're just left to get on with it and explore the game world with very little in the way of clues as to what to do. So all that we've done so far is a small round trip to barter off items and make a profit so we have enough money to buy the items we need to survive the rest of the game. Here we're going to need the gramophone and the umbrella much later on in order to do some more bartering. We're also going to need to stock up on supplies for the jeep. We're preparing to be away from Merida for some time because the game's world is a straight line with the city at the left hand side. We have to make it all the way along the road visiting cut down versions of several real world Mayan excavation sites with a couple of native villages along the way, and then get all the way back before we run out of any vital resources. This means we have to keep our slowly depleting energy bar up, and you have to keep an eye on your levels of petrol and oil as well on the right hand side of the driving screen. Without oil the jeep can't reach its top speed, and if you run out of petrol you'll be faced with a game over. You can often find food lying around in ancient temples in surprisingly edible condition, and you have a medikit that you can use three times, but there's no way to stock up on any supplies for your jeep unless you're in Merida. So we're headed to Axmal for real now. This time we'll take the other road to bypass the village, though we could also have gone back to it and then continued to Axmal beyond that as well. 
To explain a bit more about the driving sections, your jeep has a total of two gears and their presence is more of an annoyance than anything else. To begin from a standstill, you have to have the gear stick in the upright position, and you can get up to 60 km per hour before having to hit the shift key to tilt it forwards and go into high gear. Sometimes it pays to be cautious and not go at full throttle because the roads get a lot more dangerous as you get further away from the city, but I'm not sure if the petrol consumption is affected by which gear you're in. So here we are at Uxmal, which will be the first place in which we do something that resembles adventuring. Before we go in, I'm going to save the game again. Notice here that the save feature gets blocked out after you use it, and you need to move to a new location or die and have loaded from a save before it becomes active again. This is a restriction which feels awfully pointless. I found it wise to keep to the edges of the screens here because of all the snakes crawling around in the courtyard. They're randomly generated when you come onto the screen, and as Michael doesn't know the meaning of the term hurrying up, they catch up with you very quickly. If you're bitten, you lose a bit of energy, and I'm pretty sure that your energy bar starts to deplete much faster until you heal, but that could be psychological. Anyway, after an awkward stretch across to F3 to pick the thing on the floor up, we've collected our first item from the temple. It's a small red statue. The mural that I just looked at depicts this statue, along with a couple of others, standing in front of a figure. There are several other murals dotted around this temple that show a couple of the statues in their correct places, as if the aim of the puzzle was to collect all the information together and then work out the correct sequence, but this mural shows all four of the statues and makes all the others unnecessary, so I'm really not sure what they were going for. This screen's unusually empty this time around, as the snakes seem to have suddenly gone off for their lunch break, but that's fine by me. Here in the left-hand room, we can collect a stone tablet that has some use later on, even though I didn't actually find it during the game, and one of the more pointless murals that doesn't tell us anything that we don't already know. And with that, that's all that we need to do in Uxmal for now. After a very narrow escape from a snake bite, which you can tell didn't connect because Michael didn't stop and flinch, we have to dance our way out through the snakes by clinging to the edge of the screen where we can dodge away if any of them come too close. We can't do anything else at Uxmal yet, making it actually unique in being the only location in the game that you have to visit more than once if you're not relying on future knowledge. Our next destination is a stop off at a native village in the direction of Tikal. As you'll see in a moment, the road is becoming a bit more challenging here, with large boulders dotted around. If you collide with one, then you'll come to a dead stop and have to reset the gear stick and everything to get going again. This is an annoyance, but the jeep doesn't have a damage meter, and I don't think that crashing into things really penalises you in any meaningful way. You're also getting the exciting sight of me having a bit of trouble with the gear stick. I couldn't work out why I couldn't accelerate correctly, but sometimes the controls are a little unresponsive. I eventually found that the most reliable way of changing up to high gear was to hit shift, then momentarily let go of the up arrow and press it down again to zoom up to top speed. When the road splits, there are sometimes statues or markers that indicate which way you should go, but they're not always there and the sprites don't scale into view anywhere near in time for you to react to them. Perhaps this is another argument for taking your time on these sections. As I noticed when the jeep suddenly came to a stop, we've now gone through one full tank of petrol and we have to refill by hitting the F1 key using one of our precious cans. There's a limit to how many of these you can reasonably buy in the game, so you really have to know where you're going in order not to waste fuel and find yourself stranded. So we're in another village. I mentioned earlier that each of them has a unique background, but the actual contents of the villages remain the same each time, with just one disapproving native willing to barter with you. This time they have a vaguely familiar looking statue, as well as the head of a clay figurine that the walkthrough tells me is important. I backed out of this screen accidentally and left it in the video so that I could make another point about how awkward the controls were. The Enter key, despite being universally known as a confirmation, here acts as a back button and takes you out of the hut. Instead, you have to use the action button Shift to confirm your choices. It sounds natural if your hands are there for playing the rest of the game, but this so-called action button really does very little throughout the walking sections of the game, and you'll be used to hitting the function keys to perform actions instead. Nevertheless, we've acquired the clay figurine and the statue, so we're heading off down the road again. Once again, the road is getting a bit less well-travelled and a bit more bouldery, and there's also a new element coming up here. The wooden bridges here look rickety, but don't really pose a threat at this stage, because even though guardrails have not yet been invented here, you really have to be trying hard in order to fall off them.
So here we are in Tikal, which is possibly one of the most recognisable location names featured in the game. This version has three buildings that we need to explore, and a new element of danger as these people will occasionally poke their heads out of the bushes and fire a blow dart at you. The way to avoid them is to crouch down when the dart is already airborne. If you're too late, then you'll get hit. If you're too early, they'll aim lower to hit you anyway. We need to look at this door and memorise the two vaguely Mayan-looking glyphs that appear on it. You can see I have the lamp out here, because if you enter a dark room without it, you'll get a message saying it's too dark to see. If you don't have it in your inventory by now, then your only option is to turn back and go to Merida again. You might also notice that it's a bit finicky about being turned on and off. I sometimes press F9 to toggle it, and you even see the action button flash as I do so, but sometimes it just doesn't react. Incidentally, I don't think I realised there were three buildings when I first played this game, because it's quite difficult to notice whether you can even leave the screen on the left or right. This is a problem that's common to most locations in the game. In this building, we get another piece of the stone tablet that we picked up in Uxmal. Then the crowbar finally gets some use. You have to stand in the right place off to the side, and lever the heavy stone trapdoor off the stairs. With that done, you have to go down into the lower level, and have to look at all the glyphs being held by these statues. You have to push the one that matches the top one we saw on the door, which I was lucky enough to find the first time here, then we'll repeat that for the middle building. If you push the wrong symbol, then the blow dart will shoot at you from the dragon heads up at the top, doing a small damage but then draining your health faster over time just like the snakes. Showing one of the game's more infuriating control oddities, you must be facing left or right to crouch down, you can't do it while you're walking in or to or out of the screen. That means that you have to have especially quick reactions to turn and crouch if one of the blow darters comes onto the screen when you're heading to one of the buildings, and those are reactions I didn't have. I decided to leave the wound untreated for now because you have limited use of your medikit, and I didn't want to patch myself up only to get punctured again on the way out. As I started to research the real-world versions of these locations so that I would have something to say during the many dull parts of the game, I actually found myself quite impressed with the attention to detail that the game's team had put in, which was far more than I expected for a small 1989 game. All the Mayan dig locations are real, and they even look quite comparable to their real-life counterparts. The least accurate of them by far is the city Merida, which is the capital of Yucatan and is a thriving cultural centre and tourist city, far from the game's depiction of a sort of godforsaken dump consisting of one store, three people and two sombreros. Tikal doesn't show a huge resemblance to the real-world version, as the real-life one is much bigger and has a national park around it, but the buildings here look conceivably like they were based on the structures at the top of its pyramidal temples, which are called roof combs. The door in this left-hand building has now quietly opened, thanks to ancient Mayan remote sensor and microcontroller technology, and we can walk in to claim our prize. The little green thing that Michael has just picked up is a fragment of Mayan statue that's eventually going to become the key to unlocking the ultimate goal of the game. Here I was just testing what he would say about the big stone statue. He has three generic responses for looking at just about anything, and they're not very helpful. Now we've got what we came for. Across the three buildings we picked up that statue piece, a stone tablet and another red statue, and we won't have anything more to do in Tikal for the rest of the game. Our next destination is another village in the direction of Copan. By the way, you might notice here that I'm running low on energy. I'm still deliberately ignoring it here, just in case I get hit again, and the energy bar doesn't deplete during driving sections, so we should be okay for the next while. While we're driving then, I might as well share some thoughts that I had so far. It has to be said I'm not totally sure how to classify this game. It's sort of an adventure, but there's very little in the way of actual puzzles, and for the most part you'll just be gathering up items and then putting them down in the right places. At the time, French games like this one had a reputation for being obtuse and impenetrable, and this one definitely lives up to the stereotype. As I mentioned, I'm following a walkthrough here, and there are very few places in which I can work out how the player was meant to arrive at the solutions it's giving me. I don't mean that each individual task you have to do to complete the game is necessarily all that difficult, but matching the clues up with their solutions is very hard with literally no pointers as to what you're meant to be doing from the start. In that way I suppose that you could say this is an early example of an open world game, but from an era before we knew how to make open world games good. Here it's left so open that it's up to the player to gradually discover what the point of the game even is, rather than giving them a goal to work towards, and exploration is prohibitively hostile. You really need to know what you're doing in order not to run out of supplies. These divots I've been driving into, by the way, are this section's especially annoying new road obstacle. You can see them approaching, but you can't see which side the little bridges are on until it's far too late to react to them and you just drive in. Thankfully you can never die from these, they're just yet another irritation that makes you have to shift down into first gear and build up your speed again.
We've now arrived at the third and last native village, and the barterer here has the third of the stone tablets that we allegedly need. We offer a gramophone in exchange, and that's the last trade we ever have to make. The way that I'm obviously nearing death means that it's finally time to open the medikit, which has three different types of items in it, and I'm not really sure what at least two of those do. The bottles that look like they're medicinal alcohol or something are the most obvious because they refill your energy to maximum, and presumably some combination of the syringes and bandages are used to heal poisonous bites so that your health bar doesn't drain quite as fast. But my approach was always to let health get right down to the bottom and then to use all three of the items at the same time so that I was completely healthy again. By the way, these are all the health supplies that are available in the entire game. You can't refill this. Once you've run out of food and medicine and gone through your fourth health bar, the game is over. As I'm going to demonstrate in comical fashion here, if you crash into the sides of the road in the jeep, it can be extremely difficult to get it going again. It has not been blessed with a reverse gear, and so your only option is really to just ram into the jungle sprites while holding the turn key until you can just about get out of it. Sometimes the game seems to take pity on you, and lets the jeep suddenly swivel round on the spot so you can get going again. I mentioned the surprising realism of the game before, so here's a map of the real-world equivalent of the road that we've taken. It really is a believable route, starting in the north with Merida in Mexico, and then visiting the locations that we've seen so far in order, on our way to the south just over the border into Honduras. The only slight detail they glossed over is that this route is over a thousand kilometres in real life and would take 20 hours to drive. With this in mind, our jeep's previously unimpressive fuel consumption becomes quite spectacular. After a generous punch to the back of the head, we have to go to the left along a route that is frankly impossible to see. You get the feeling that something's here because this screen exists, but you have to walk between two trees up here in what looks like a dead end in order to reach an important location. And sadly for us, this important set of screens are full of this location's enemy of choice, these chompy, bitey-headed plants. At least they're an improvement over the snakes, as they're immobile, but they turn from side to side seemingly at random, and they can stunlock you if you get too close and they feel like being malicious. So having put up with those, you arrive on this screen with some scattered ruins. The only important part is this one, and the crowbar comes into play for the second time here, as we need to savagely upend this wonderfully preserved ancient stone in order to grab another of the little red statues we've been collecting. It's hard to say if I would have worked this out independently. Whenever I played this game without the benefit of a walkthrough, I had no idea that this location even existed, and there's no reason for the statue to be hidden there. But if you do get here, the stone is really the only thing that stands out on the screen, and your choice of items to try using on things is pretty limited, so there isn't much to go through if you're just experimenting randomly. The real-life Copan ruins are famed for their intricate carvings, and the VGA version of them we're going into now look like they might have been inspired by a building designated Temple 11, which is also called the Temple of Inscriptions. The browner shade of stone here is recreated using a palette swap when you're inside the building. Fortunately, not all items in this game are difficult to find, this bit of statue is just lying around in an empty room. But the part coming up needs some explanation. We're about to go through a room with a grid of tiles, where if you make a wrong move, a giant spiked mace will drop from the ceiling and take off a massive amount of your energy bar. This is possibly the single largest thing that could be described as a puzzle in the game, and I couldn't fathom it out at all while playing. The walkthrough just said to combine the circle of winds, the stone tablets, and the clue on the wall in the middle room to arrive at the solution to the puzzle, but didn't explain the first thing about how. Fortunately, it also provided a map of the solution as well. It was only after going back after completing the game and poring over the inventory items it mentioned that I finally worked out how to solve it, though it has to be said that I just mapped out the whole floor by trial and error first, and then used that to work backwards along the path to the solution. It's a puzzle with a surprising number of stages to working it out. If you look at the edges of the three stone tablets, you can tell that they can be pushed together to form one wide one in a certain order. At the time this game was made, you would have had to copy down the shape and contents of the tablets onto paper to work this out, but I'm very grateful for being able to take screenshots. With that realisation, you then have to read the symbols as in English from left to right, top to bottom, unlike the layout implied by the separate stone tablets, which matches up with the way to read real-life Mayan glyphs, which is in pairs of columns. As for what the symbols mean, you have to look at the colours of the floor tiles, which are grey towards the back of the screen and brown towards the front. Therefore, the grey glyph means move a tile up, from the camera's perspective, and brown means move a tile down. You don't really need the circle of winds, because you could conclude that the white symbol means move forward by process of elimination, but if you look at the wedges in this view you get from the inventory, the position of the white symbol matches up to what you'd expect. 
The path is written out starting from this square, which is noticeable because it's the only plain one among the grid of stars, but otherwise there's nothing explicitly saying this is the place where you need to begin. And one further point of confusion is that the right-hand column of tiles on one screen is the same as the left-hand column on the next screen. You don't count moving between screens as a move forward. Having digested all of that and got successfully across the hall, we enter another dark room that contains the latest piece of the statue that we've slowly been assembling throughout the game. If we look at the clue on the wall, we can conclude very quickly that this is an Indiana Jones-style weight trap. If we turn around and pick up the statue piece from the balance, the door closes to trap us inside. The solution, of course, is to replace the jade statue head with the clay one that we bartered for all the way back before Tikal. It was here, however, that I ran into another of the game's peculiarities, as I couldn't find the clay head that I was meant to use despite being sure that I bought it. It turns out that even though you have a limitless inventory, there's no ability to scroll it. It will only ever allow you to access the top 15 items, and the clay statue head wasn't among them. The game's interface also makes it unnecessarily awkward to check which head you're looking at, because the inventory screen on F1 and the drop screen on F4 are different. You can't get a description of what an item is and be able to drop it from the same place. After some fumbling around, I finally decided to drop the stone tablets to bubble the clay statue head to the surface again. Once that's placed on the balance, you're free to go. On the way back, you can take any route you like, because when the spiked maces come down from the ceiling, it's possible to duck under them to avoid any damage. This is a very awkward way of doing it though, especially as the crouch control can be frustratingly unresponsive. Therefore, here's a game over. This bit of text is actually unique to the PC. The Amiga and Atari versions of this game got a much more elaborate scene of Michael laid out in a Mayan tomb, although I admit that it doesn't make a whole lot of sense in context. It took me a number of saves and reloads to escape taking the straight route out, and overall you're just as well to go back along the same path that you came in by if you can remember it, or work backwards with the clue. Incidentally, you can't do this trick on your way across the tiles the first time, because the stone door on the right won't open unless you've got across without stepping on any false tiles. We've now reached the furthest point that we're going to go for now on our Mayan tour. We'll deal with the last destination beyond Copan a bit later on, but just now we need to go back to the north, complete something that we've left unfinished earlier, and then collect some more supplies. You can bet that I'm going to speed up the driving sections from now on, because I've completely run out of things to say about them, and this video is getting long enough already. However, I do want to bring up that I was curious as to whether the game's roads were consistent when you were travelling back along the road you came from. So I scribbled the route down as I watched the video back, and I was surprised that the does indeed seem to be at least some resemblance between the outward route between Tikal and Copan and the inward one. So after finding max speed capabilities in our jeep, we're back in Uxmal again. As I've said before, all the time I knew this game I had assumed that the developers would have just taken some Mayan names and made up the locations completely, but the large building that dominates this location looks conceivably like it was based on the Governor's Palace that stands in the Uxmal ruins. Our objective here is to recreate what we saw on the mural that I complained about some time ago when we stopped off here before, and to appease this alleged wizard by placing the four statues that we've collected in front of him in the correct order. He mumbles to himself and shakes his staff as you go about the task, but will give you an encouraging cheer when you put a statue down in the right place. I'm not sure how lenient the game is with exactly where on the floor the statues need to be, but fortunately I seem to get it right the first time. Once again, the open nature of the game means that you could enter this room and put down whatever statues you've collected so far at any time, but the restrictions on your life bar and fuel on top of that means that if you hadn't got all the statues in one go, you're probably now in an unwinnable state if you've done that. Still, with the wizard apparently happy, you're left to discover what actual effect this has for yourself, and the snakes are still out in force to prevent you from doing so. Putting the statues down in the right places has opened the door in the room that we didn't go into before on the very right-hand side of the building, and after getting myself a couple of bites on my ankles for my trouble, I was eventually able to make my way inside. Sitting on the pedestal here is the final piece of the jade statue we have to collect. We picked one piece up after we solved Tikal, one on the weight trap in Copan, and another that was just lying around randomly on the floor in the same temple. I was hesitating a bit here because I'd been bitten and I wasn't sure whether I wanted to just let my energy bar run out and load a game, or if I wanted to continue. Eventually I decided that I had been at low health anyway and so it didn't really matter, and elected to heal and attempt not to be bitten again on the way out. 
While I'm dancing around attempting to avoid the rest of the snakes, I can explain what's going on with the wider picture. Once you've got all of the jade statue pieces, the individual items in your inventory are quietly replaced with the complete Mayan idol. And though the game is characteristically indifferent about its significance, this is going to be what we use to reach the game's final objective. First of all, let's speed things up again and zoom back to Merida so we have enough petrol for the last long drive. Here back in home sweet Merida, we can walk past the rival again, whose name is Orlik Karloff, which is a vaguely Eastern European first name, though it never comes up in the game and never matters, and go back to the store one last time to stock up on our supplies. It was at this moment that I nearly had a heart attack, because I was almost out of fuel and money and the walkthrough was telling me to sell off two jars that I didn't have. I checked back through it again and indeed it tells you to sell the jars off at the start of the game and then again at the end. I remember that two more jars are available in the game in the second native village, but I'm not sure how to arrange things so that you can barter for them and have them to sell off at this point. Most of the artefacts you've collected are worthless to the man at the shop, but I was eventually saved by noticing that I could pawn off the Circle of Winds that hadn't really helped me anyway, and get $400 or pesos for it. I'm not quite sure which currency Michael brought with him. Interestingly, you can also choose to sell out and give him the Mayan statue for a price of 1000 if you feel like you've got this far in the game and it's just not worth carrying on. The walkthrough here said that I should now buy four cans of petrol and two of oil, but even after desperately searching my inventory for something else to raise funds, I was too skint for this so I decided just to get two cans of petrol and trust that the engine could last out without oil, and just hope for the best. Our last destination in the game, the furthest point from the city, is Shiken Itza, which I looked up how to pronounce beforehand to avoid me making it sound like an ancient Mayan poultry fast food restaurant. Its name means at the mouth of the well of the enchanted water, and it's possibly the most famous archaeological site in Mexico. It's also the only glaring inaccuracy in the game's map, as the real-life site is actually slightly to the east of Merida, and nowhere near where you'd logically get to after continuing south along the route we've been going. While we're making our way a couple of thousand miles to the last dig site on two and a half cans of petrol and an engine that's gradually seizing up, here are a couple of interesting things that I found while poking around in the game's save file. It's called p.dat, and it's quite easy to mess with, it doesn't have any countermeasures like a checksum. Your health is stored in byte 01, and usually the maximum is 200, but you can boost this all the way up to 255 with no ill effects. Nearby, bytes 04 and 05 hold your available cash, which starts at 1000. If you'd like to make the game a bit easier for yourself and avoid the bartering at the start to raise money, you can whack this all the way up to the tens of thousands without the game complaining. Slightly further down, bytes 2, 1, 2, 3, and 2, 5 store the number of syringes, bandages, and bottles that you have in your first aid kit, respectively. You can set any of these higher than 3, and you'll get some weird effects as other inventory graphics appear on the medikit screen, but the game will otherwise behave correctly and allow you to carry them. So this is particularly useful if you've been poisoned more than 3 times, which is a likely possibility. Speaking of poison, it does appear to be a real state and not my imagination, and it has something to do with swapping the contents of two other bytes near here from a value of 3 to zero, but I'm unsure exactly what each of them mean. The last obstacles that the driving sections throw at you on your way to the final dig site are these half bridges, where parts have fallen off the already dodgy looking structures that span the cliffs and leave large gaps for your jeep to fall down. I found myself half glad that I didn't have the ability to go at full speed here, having run out of oil, as I'm not sure whether these would have just caused an inconsequential crash like the other half bridges, or been an instant game over. Anyway, after only just having to use our last can of petrol, here we are at last. The large pyramid here is clearly modelled on the one that stands at the centre of the real-life site, which is called the Pyramid of Kukulkan, or El Castillo as it was named by the conquistadors. It stands 98 feet high, and its architecture shows the Mayan's strong understanding of astronomy. There are 91 steps on each of the four sides of the pyramid, and one additional step into the temple at the top, which brings the total to 365, one for each day of the year. This irritating condor doesn't have a real-life analogy, and exists just to make the climax of the game a little more awkward. Michael is far too slow to have a hope of dodging it, but you can just about get by if you nudge yourself right and left a bit and duck at random intervals. Orlik is waiting downstairs, and even though I could have practiced fighting earlier on whenever he appeared, in this run-through I'm now going to face him for the first time. Fighting him beforehand can knock him out for a bit, but he won't ever be eliminated from the game. 
I'd first like to demonstrate a failed attempt just to illustrate how horribly awkward the combat is. You hold down the action button and press up to strike in whichever direction you happen to be facing, as long as it's left or right. But if Orlik gets the first punch in, you won't get a chance to retaliate. You have to dodge his punch by crouching down first, where he'll comically be unable to see you slightly outside his line of sight until you pop up again and sock him. However, the window of his recovery time is very small and the controls really feel sluggish, making this a hugely frustrating part of the game. I have many, many failed takes of this part, before I eventually knocked him off once and for all. Having done that, the final puzzle is honestly a bit of a mystery to me. The walkthrough said to place the statue pieces on the first, third and fourth pedestals, which made me suspicious again because I didn't have any, I just had the complete idol. So at first I tried substituting the pieces of the stone tablet to no apparent effect. Then I switched to using the statue instead, placing it on the forbidden second platform first by mistake, with much the same results. But at last, when I put it on the fourth pedestal, I was excited to see the bridge to the left lowering down, surely guiding me towards the end of the game. My celebration was, however, short-lived because after a couple of screens of navigating the walkway, the bridges rose up again when I was on this island, leaving me to plummet into the abyss. I think that placing the statue on each pedestal might toggle the state of one of the bridges, but there's absolutely no reaction to indicate this is the case apart from for the bridge that's actually on the screen where you're messing with the controls. As you can't tell what position each bridge is in before you start walking across them, I'm really not sure how you're meant to solve this without going by trial and error. Still, as the walkthrough says, the solution is to put the statue on the first, third and fourth pedestals, then just walk across and let the bridges toggle as you reach the islands. Somehow, telepathically, you're meant to make sure that the bridges are placed in such a way that they'll lower into position as you make your way across. You have to make sure you remember to actually pick the statue up again before you cross, because the final thing you have to do in the game is restore Lefetiche Maya to its rightful place on this pedestal here, and walk into the opened doorway. And would you believe it, the reward for all of that palaver is a still image that you can't quit out of, making it the last frame that DOSBox will display and so Fraps didn't bother capturing it. Fortunately, I can show you this screenshot from Abandonia, where Sabatioanos, the only other person in the world to have completed this game, was generous enough to provide one. It shows a crazed and much more poorly drawn Michael swimming in mountains of gold which he can now get rich quick from on the black market, which isn't really the noble ending that I was hoping for. But at least I've now completed it, just about a quarter of a century after having first played this thing. I took a look at some magazine reviews to check how the game had been received at the time. Most were fairly indifferent about the game, saying there wasn't much there, but it was okay for a cheap game. The most decisive review I could find came from Amiga Power, which called it stunningly boring and gave it an overall score of 9%. It's a curious thing that I'm told shares a lot with Silmaril's other work, being a relatively simple adventure wrapped up in the wider and more difficult mystery of just working out what on earth you're meant to be doing. Still, 29 years after its release in 1989, there is finally a playthrough video of this game, and I can lay that particular spirit to rest. Unlike the spirit of the Mayan High Priest who owned all this gold, who I imagine will be seeking his revenge on Michael very soon.